My name's Lori Worth, I'm with the Madison Fire Department, and, and Cindy's letting me come into Verona today, which I think is really nice of her. Uh, Cindy Diedrich from uh, Fitzgerald EMS, and Tom Vaughn from Dane County 911. I want to give you a little bit of background on how this got started. Obviously, we do a lot of informational presentations throughout the communities that we serve, uh, talking about prevention, safety. And in the course of that, what we noticed is a lot of people had a lot of questions about how 911 works. How do you get an ambulance? Why do you sometimes get a fire truck when you call for an ambulance? How does all this stuff work? And the fact is, you know, we all work together, and there is such an amazing system within Dane County, and there are all these agencies working together, developing protocols, developing um, redundancy so that if one protocol fails, another one's right there to back it up. And so we thought it might be interesting to just come out into the community and say, this is how we all work together to get you the response you need. And uh, I can tell you that the first time we presented this, uh, two people showed up. But since then, it's gotten better. <laughs> so I'm really glad to see all of you here today. So um, I'm just going to give you a, uh, uh, that's kind of part of my introduction. Let's see if there's anything else. So these are some of the questions we want to answer today. Who answers the phone when you call? Who responds to your emergency and how does that happen? How do the different agencies work together? And what can you do to help get yourself the best outcome? Because there are things you can do on your end too uh, that will help you streamline the process and be better prepared for when an emergency happens. I think there's one more. Nope, it's Tom. Here's Tom. Okay, go ahead to advance it. Um, I'm from the 911 Center. I've worked for the 911 Center for about six years now. I was uh, born and raised in Verona, been on the Verona Fire Department along with Dale back there for, uh, Dale's been on a lot longer than I have, uh, 32 <laughs> years. I retired a couple of years ago um, because this job was so demanding and taking a lot of my time. Um, and so uh, since uh, transitioning from being out in the field and the cold and the snowing, uh, snow and all that, I now, now have a nice warm office that I go to every day and uh, listen to phones ring endlessly, it seems like. Um, and so that's kind of my background, so I've been around Verona all my life, I, I'm, I'm sure. I, I, don't, I recognize you. I'm you're Kathy Durst. Kathy Durst, okay. Um, I married Jane Cosby. Okay. 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 Um, now you know why. <laughs> um, so let's talk about 911. Where did 911 begin? 911 first came about in 1957, and in creating uh, the 911 number, they had to, they wanted to find a number that first of all wasn't an area code, a short number, and a number that was not going to be really easy to to misdial. So if you think about what it was like in 1957 when you went to, to dial a number. Um, does this ring any bells? <laughs> uh, and nine was the number that was least likely to be dialed by mistake. And then the two ones right after that. Okay, we got one of those, okay. <laughs> that I don't know about. <laughs> um, since then, and, and kind of along that same line, my, my granddaughter asked me a couple of years ago, uh, Grandpa, how come, how come they say dial this number? There's no dials on my phone. Why don't they say push this number? Well, so I, I, I sent it right back to her. Why are you asking me? Why didn't you Google it? You know, <laughs> Google has all the answers, right? So, um, so that's kind of the story about dialing and, and why this, the generation now, they, they have no clue what dial phones are even like. So, so back in 1957, they, they chose 911 because it was short. It's easy to remember hard to misdial on a dial phone. Um, and um, it hadn't been assigned to a, an area code yet. So the first 911 uh, was actually set up in um, Haleyville, Haleyville, Alabama. And um, that county went system-wide in 1968. Okay. Interestingly enough, the same year, the second 911 service popped up in all places, Nome, Alaska. So maybe it was because they had the least number of phones. It wasn't hard for them to do, but um, 
Back in the uh, early 70s then, um, the Madison Fire Department, the Dane County Sheriff's Department, the Madison Police Department, to reach them, you all had to dial a different number. So it was 255-7272, I think was the old Madison Fire Department number. And remembering, and you had to remember, use your phone books to look at, do I need the sheriff, do I need uh, the fire department, do I need the Madison Police Department back then, of course. Um, the sheriff's departments, the deputies, were also the ambulance services. If some of you may recall, they, they had station wagons where they would throw you in the back of the station wagon and rush you off to the hospital. So this is a, a shot of the um, one of the original um, Madison Fire on my dispatch centers. And Dale Hagen, do you know who this is? Um, I should probably, right? Jeff Duffler. Oh, that's my yeah. son. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, right. <laughs> Jeff Duffler retired, uh, retired a year ago as an as a assistant chief. So I should have asked you if you recognize you know, <laughs> um, yeah, this is a picture of the, the of the sheriff's department and their dispatch center. At the time, this was uh, three or four blocks away from the Madison Fire Department dispatch. This was at, at the upstairs of the jail at the city county building. Some of those old pieces are still up there in, in the archives of the city county building. So. So the sheriff's department was in a different place. The fire department was in another different place. So when, um, go ahead and advance that if you want. Um, and that was the Madison Police, I think, uh, dispatch side. So on January 25th, we just celebrated our anniversary here, uh, 1989 in Coney Island when one system was put into place. Um, and the first official call came in, actually I understand a little before 10.30, the launch was 10.30, but another, a call snuck in a couple of minutes early that we, did, we weren't prepared for, apparently. So um, that was the bringing together of all these different agencies, the police department, the fire department, in Madison, um, sheriff's deputies, and some of the municipal uh, towns, like the Verona Police Department's calls were out into the night one um, Sunday. Some of you may recall in Verona having to call um, the police and hopefully there was somebody at the police station to answer the phone in Verona. So um, all those calls came to the central location and that's what it looks like today. Um, we were talking earlier about technology. Yeah, uh, I sit around about six different computers at the same time and, and so my, my view of the world is basically computers. Um, some of them are radios, some of them are phones, uh, some of them um, guide us in telling whether to send some of these people or Lori's people. Um, and, and these different agencies. So we've come a long way in the, in the last 30, 25, 30 years. Um, the mission of our, of our department is to coordinate efficient and effective communications between the citizens at large and visitors of our community and those different agencies that are charged with providing services. Uh, we represent 84 different agencies between police, fire, and EMS agencies animal control, parking enforcement, a lot of different agencies that we represent. So we bring this all together. Um, and as a result, we get a lot of phone calls. Over half a million phone calls a year come into our center. We handle both the non-emergency calls as well as the emergency 911 calls. And as you can see, uh, the 911 calls, we handle around 500 a day. And of those, 80% of them are from cell phones. And that's important in a way because if you're calling from your home phone, we know what your address is. But if you call from a cell phone, we may not know where you are. So it's critical for us to, before we can do anything else, is to find out exactly where you are so we know uh, where we can send help. And until we know that, we really can't go on a whole lot. So um, as more and more people use cell phones, it becomes more and more challenging for us make sure we know where people are, actually are. Okay. Of those calls, um, most of those are calls for police services. Parking dogs, parking uh, thefts, burglaries, damage to mailboxes, car crashes, all those different things that the police deal with. And uh, about 27,000 of those are, are calls for medical assistance, for EMS services. And thankfully, a very small portion of those are actually fire incidents, and it continues to drop, and I think Lori will talk about that a little bit, a little bit later. Um, so um, the fire department primarily, as we once thought 
pretty pretty much put off fires. Their primary role the, um, nowadays is, is assisting with medical issues and EMS calls. That's a majority of their volume right now. And prevention. And prevention. <laughs> <laughs> so how does 911 work? Uh, how many in this room have dialed 911? Most of you. We should never be afraid to dial 911 when, when you think you need help. Um, we're there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, sometimes we're busier than others. Sometimes it may take a couple of rings before we answer. But but don't hang up. Stay on the line if you have to call us because we will get to your phone. Okay. Um, what happens in 911? Uh, the, the when you dial 911 from your home phone, from here, from your cell phone, um, it recognizes where you are generally or what cellular tower you reach, and from that it recognizes where it needs to send that call through the phone network. And if you're in Verona and you call 911, it knows to send that call to us in Madison at the city county building, where your call will then be answered. There are some communities in Dane County where it knows you're in Middleton, and so it sends the call to Middleton. Okay. So there are some areas of Dane County where 911 won't come to us, it'll go to another center, but we take a majority, I would say 95% of the 911 calls in Dane County. Then what happens is the call taker, also known as the operator dispatch, asks uh, where the emergency is. Again, the important thing for us is to know where you are or where the emergency is. Without that, we really can't do a whole lot more. Um, so we are very persistent on making sure we know where you are. Even if our, our computer tells us you're calling from the Rona Senior Center, we're going to ask you anyways to verify that. And that gives us that certainty that Okay, this is where this person that needs help is. Then we can go on and, and assist in getting those the right help to the people that need it. So then depending on the emergency, our call takers enter this information in the computer and they hit a, uh, one key and it sends it to a dispatcher. Somebody else then is calling Cindy's group, calling Lori's group. Meanwhile, I'm still able to stay on the telephone with you. Okay. So we have what, what's called a horizontal dispatch. We don't talk to the police, we don't talk to the ambulance people. We take the call, we focus on the people that need help. And that, that's really key because in our community it allows us to give life-saving instructions. Um, I've delivered a baby over the phone. I've unfortunately had to talk people and teach people over the phone how to do CPR. But that allows us to focus on getting immediate needs to the to people that need it. Um, so our talking and asking questions isn't delaying help from coming. Yes. Okay. Um, so if I would, I've never had to call 911. If I would ever have to call 911, am I better off letting you take charge of the script than saying, yes. oh my God, there's somebody in the window on a cake, you know? Completely. <laughs> She's three slides down on Completely. Like, you're, you're jumping right <laughs> <up. laughs> Definitely. Because the faster we can get some of those key questions answered, the faster we can get some of these people on the road. And you should not hang up your phone, even yeah. if you're calling. Not unless we tell you to. We, if we say, it's okay now, unlock your door, I'm going to let you go, you can hang up now, then it's okay. Okay. Because otherwise, we, you know, we need to try to call you back and reach you. Uh -huh. And that further could delay things. So it's, that's a very good point. Okay. Um, here's another uh, shot of our, of our current um, call center. Notice that he's sitting on a really tall chair. We have the ability now with our call center because I, today, with the exception of my little break to come here, I'm working a 12-hour shift. So sitting in front of computers can get long, especially on busy days where today, like today when the calls are coming in one right after another. So this allows us to stand up. And we're although we're hooked down with our headsets, it allows us to stand up and talk and dispatch and move around a little bit and get our blood flowing a little bit. So. Um, we're very fortunate to have a center that, that's uh, somewhat comfortable and dark, as you can see. Tom? <laughs> it is dark. How many uh, dispatchers have we got working at one time? Um, at, uh, on, on a normal day uh, in the afternoon, when, when we're busiest, the afternoons and evenings, we're up to 15. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that it's not 15 people taking phone calls because there are uh, three that are dedicated to police dispatching, there are two dedicated to fire dispatching. Um, their primarily, primary role is to, um, to handle radio procedures, getting ambulances going, fire trucks going, police cars going. 
Um, so that reduces the number of people we have taking phone calls at a time. And when we have something like we did in Madison today, pulls in another person just dedicated to a certain event that's going on that's taking a lot of time. So uh, we have to have that flexibility of being able to move people around. So um, when we knew the snow was coming, we staffed up. So we probably up to 17 right now because of the additional call volume, people sliding off the road and stuff like that. So, um, and that's 24-7. We, you know, we're, we're, we're there all the time. And one very important thing that we follow is we are rec uh, nationally recognized for using uh, worldwide protocols uh, for uh, critique and triaging phone calls um, that allows us to make sure that we um, get the right help to the right people as efficiently as we can, yet at the same time provide instructions to help you in the meanwhile over the phone. And, and our center is uh, nationally accredited in achieving those goals. So one of the things we have to do is besides follow the protocols, um, we have to also monitor and score our phone calls to make sure we're following those protocols. That's one of my jobs right now is to spend a lot of time listening to phone calls and making sure we're asking the right questions and, and, and sending the right help in the right amount of time in order to meet those accreditation standards. So um, know that we're very fortunate in Dane County in that we're using these nationally recognized standards to give fast help to the, to the people that need it. Okay. This is an example of one of the protocols that we use. Now keep in mind, this is a picture of a card file, a flip card system that we have available to us. Fortunately with technology, we now have the same protocol developed into a computer program. So we're clicking through these questions and getting to what we find out is the final code. And that code is important and that tells us how much help to send and how fast to send it. Okay. So we go through this questioning process of What's the address of the emergency? Tell me exactly what happened. Uh, the phone number you're calling from. We just go down through this process, and based upon the answers we're getting, we, we go into further cards that, go ahead and page down, I think there's another one. Um, so the answer to the question is, my friend is having a diabetic problem. We ask the question, is the, is, is the, uh, is the patient completely alert? No not completely alert, we've got our answer, we're going to send it as a 13 Charlie 1. And that 13 Charlie 1 tells Cindy and Lori's people, we got to go fairly quick because the patient's condition is deteriorating. Then, if we get to a, a particular call where we have to give CPR instructions to a caller, this is the process we follow based on the answers to the question. Is the person breathing? No. Go to number four. Is the patient breathing? Yes. Go to number three. And this walks us through giving the instructions to the caller to perhaps save or sustain someone's life until the responders can get there. So we like to consider ourselves actually the first first responder because we really can talk people into helping the person until the actual feet on the ground, people can, can get there and help them. So, again, following our instructions, allowing us to help calm the callers down, because sometimes, yeah, they are hysterical. And sometimes all we get is screaming. Um, and frankly, sometimes all, you know, it's the eight or nine year old that's calling us. Ironically, they're the calmest. So, they are the calmest. In, in fact, there was one time where we could hear a child talking in the side and, a, and mom was just going hysterical and the, the call taker said, can you hand the phone to the child next to you? <laughs> and, and she did and we got a clear address then and understood what was going on. I, I think children may not understand, not, they don't have the experiences that we have and how bad things can maybe be. So, so these, these protocols that we follow help us help the, the caller, help the patient and tell the okay? okay? I think this is you, Cindy. This is me. No, if you don't mind if I sit here, is that okay? 
Right. Otherwise, I pace all over anyway. And then, like I did, right? Yeah. No, I really cruise. <laughs> so my name is Cindy Dietrich. I'm one of the deputy chiefs at Fitchmona. I've been there for 15 years. I've been a paramedic for about the past, well, been a paramedic for 15 years as well, but Fitchmona didn't go paramedic until 2001. So we've only been doing that for about 12 years. Um, right now, um, we have 14 full-time paramedics that work on our ambulance. This is a picture of some of our staff. We tried really hard to get a picture of everyone this last fall, and we ended up with just a very small portion because we happen to be a very busy ambulance service. Um, we ran over 2,500 calls last year, so um, we keep ourselves quite busy. We have a medical director that's part of our staff. Because we're doing pre-hospital medicine, we have to have a medical director that tells us what we can and can't do out in the field. We have an EMS chief, his name is Brian Merland. I don't know if any of you know Brian, but he's an awesome chief. We have 14 full-time paramedics. We also have seven LTE or limited term employees. They help us out with vacations and sick leave. We also have a few volunteer EMTs. Everyone that we have on staff that's on the ambulance is a paramedic or they're a long, long standing EMTs that have been with us from the start of time. I don't know if any of you know Rita and Ron Martin. Rita and Ron Martin have been with us since we started. We started back in 1977, and they've been with us from day one. So they, they are still riding with us. They're not paramedic, but they ride very consistently every week and help us out tremendously. We also have a district accountant. He's a retired accountant, and he comes in and helps us with our books. His name is Lon Schwartz. So our staffing, we have our 14 paramedics, we ride 24-hour shifts, and we do two shifts a week. So we ride 48 hours each week. We always have two paramedics on at a minimum. Again, sometimes we might have extra people riding along, but we always have two <coughs> paramedics. That's really important because some of the things that we do out in the field really require two heads that are really thinking at that same medical level. We have two ambulance locations. Where there's one up in Fitchburg, which is at Station 2. There's another one here in Verona. We've been here in Verona for about five years now. We're going on five years. It was supposed to be short term, but that's not usually how it works out. But we're right over on Venture Court, so we're very close to this location right now. Our district runs about 70 square miles. And the little yellow axes are kind of hard to see, but that's actually the locations of the ambulances. There's different levels of practice for emergency medical technicians, and I don't know if you all understand this, but it's my chance to plug where Fitchroni is. There's actually three levels of EMT out in the field that are doing responses on an ambulance. There's EMT basic, there's EMT, it's intermediate, or now it's going to be called advanced, and then there's EMT paramedic. So paramedic is the highest level of service that you can get out in the field, which is pretty exciting for us. It took us a long time to get to paramedic. As I said, we started in 1977. We didn't go paramedic until 2001. What you'll typically find is that paramedic level services have career staff, meaning they have people that are working full time. It's very difficult to work on a part time basis or a volunteer basis and practice paramedicine. It's very complicated. So it was a big stride for Fitchburg and Verona to go ahead and allow us to become paramedic. So um, what is a paramedic? I, again, I'm going to tell it a little bit. It's the highest level of training. Um, we do CPR and advanced cardiac life support. So we work really heavily with people who are having cardiac issues. We carry a lot of medications that we can give to patients out in the field to try to curb what's going on with their cardiac issue. We carry medicines that will help with pain. So we go out to Mount Horeb quite often during the ski season and we help out some of those skiers that have taken a tumble on the ski hill. So we can give those you know, narcotic medicines to take away some of the pain. We defibrillate, we put in airways, we do all of that kind of stuff as well, depending obviously on the level of the call. So there's different types of emergency medical technician practice. There's 911, which is what Fitchrona is. That means that all of our calls are dispatched through Tom's 911 center. We do not just, if a clinic calls us up, we don't go over and pick up a patient. 
Tom has to tell us, Vitrona, you, you have a call, you need to respond to this address. The other type is inner facility, and that would be um, an ambulance that does not respond to any 911 calls. What they do is they go in between hospital to hospital or nursing home to hospital, and they're not actually out on the street responding to car accidents or going to people's homes. So there is a difference in that, and we're 911 strictly. So what can we do? Like I said, we'll breathe for you. We can put tubes down your throat. We only do that if we need to. That's not really common practice, but if you need it, we're there to give it to you. We can um, give medications. We do IVs. We have different ways of giving medications. We can give medications through veins. We can give medications through bones, which sounds kind of creepy, but it's actually very effective. We can also just give you regular shots in your muscles. We deal with the cardiac complications. If you're having breathing difficulty, you can handle those, control pains, and then diabetic emergencies. Some of these situations will actually go to your home and treat you and not take you into the hospital. It just depends on whether or not we can stabilize you, and a diabetic emergency is a real good example of that, where if you have a low blood sugar, we can go to your home, we can fix you up, we'll make sure that everything is fine and that you're mentating okay, and as long as there's someone there to help you out, make sure you get a good meal in you, we can leave you actually in your home, which that's kind of nice, because not everybody wants to go into the hospital, and we understand that. This is just more of, uh, we have our cardiac monitor, we defibrillate, and we stabilize after injuries. So some of the common calls that we have, depending on the level of call, will determine how we're going to treat you. And I've got some of the instruments that we would typically use. A lot of times we'll start an IV of just, it's just normal saline, so it's just like your regular composition in your blood, but we start that just in case we need to give you medications. We have a defibrillator, which is in the center of this, which all that does, it can defibrillate if your heart goes into an arrest, or we can look at what your heart rhythm looks like. And depending on your heart rhythm, we'll determine what kind of treatment we'll actually do for you. So that machine does a lot. We have, obviously, blood sugar analysis. We you know, do that on just about every single patient. And then we work with oxygen and different kinds of medication treatments that we can do if you're having breathing difficulties. If you fall, this is pretty scary to people. Um, we, we do what's called a mobilization. And we're doing that because we're trying to protect you. And a lot of times people don't want this to happen to them, but we're really trying to be very careful to make sure you don't have further injury. So if you fall, don't be surprised if we come walking in with a long board that's hard, unfortunately. I wish they were soft. But then we also put collars on your neck, and we put you on the board and make sure you're not moving very much. And we do that precautionary. We really want to make sure that you don't have any kind of an injury to your neck or to your back very typical for falls and very typical for car accidents. So um, we don't do that because we're saying that you're automatically injured, we're doing that as a precaution to make sure that you don't have any further injury. Okay, can't wiggle around much. It's uncomfortable though, I have to tell you. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. Um, if you have a generalized weakness, we're going to put you on our cot. And a lot of people don't like it when we put them on our cot in the middle of their home. But that's what we do. We don't want you to stand up and try to walk. Same thing if you're having difficulty breathing or if you're having any kind of chest discomfort. We're not going to let you get up and walk around. We don't like that because we don't want you to become more ill. So we'll bring in our cot. We also have what's called a stair chair. So it's a chair that has wheels and all this stuff and we'll strap you in and we'll wheel you right out of your house that way or we'll take you down your stairs in the stair chair. What we're trying to do is make sure that you're not moving around and that you don't get more sick. So I know that the equipment feels really weird, and one of the things that's, that's very odd when you have us come on to your, into your home or something, we move very quickly. So have any of you ridden in our ambulance before? In Fitrona? Yeah, do we move pretty fast? I never got the ambulance, but you should move back to my house. <laughs> We take our jobs very seriously, so we get to your home as quickly as possible. And once we're in there, we're trying to do an assessment and get you in the back of our ambulance and on the way to the hospital as quickly as we can. We have a goal to make sure that we're not in your home more than 15 minutes. 
which sounds weird, but we're thinking the ultimate care is the hospital. That's the ultimate care, is getting you to the hospital. So we need to get to your home very quickly. What could help us out when we're going to your home? What can you think of that would help our ambulance crew out in the biggest way? Turn on lights. Turn on lights, that's huge, yeah. Flick on your light outside so we know where we're going. If you're in a larger building, if you can send someone to meet us at the doorway to bring us into the building, that's huge. You know, I know that I'm headed out to Epic. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Just say to me. It's extremely difficult. And Epic, you know, I mean, obviously that's, that's huge in itself. That's like a little municipality. But I can go over to, you know, even Badger Prairie, for example. I go into that little curved driveway. Now what? Now where do I go? And like I said, we don't want to be on scene very long. We want to come in, we want to do our assessment, take care of you, and get you going to the hospital where you have definitive care. So if there's someone that can meet us and take us right to the patient, that is really huge. It's extremely helpful. Very, very helpful for us. Mm -hmm. What do you do if like, you've fallen in your home and you know your front door is locked? <laughs> well, <laughs> I hate to say this, but we have firefighters that love to break down doors if need be. <laughs> so seriously, that's what we'll do. We don't mess around. We really don't mess around. It's kind of interesting because we talk about how we're all working together. And the last time we did this presentation, I talked about how closely people from the communication center stay in touch with us when we're on a call. So let's say, for example, I'm out and about on a call and I haven't contacted the comm center and told them, you know, we're at the patient or, you know, you know, we're getting ready to transport. He'll actually call me and say, Fitch Roman 44, is everything good for you? So they keep tabs on us. The fire department does the same thing. We work very, very closely. So we can't get into your home. Police is going, especially here in Verona, police come to almost all of our calls. I just love our police here. They're so supportive. They'll try to come to almost every one of our calls. If we need to have someone break down a door, we're going to call the fire department. And we'll say, you know, send Verona Fire over, we need access to this building. Mm -hmm. And we don't mess around with it. You know, I hate to say that because there's a broken door, but then again, we're also getting in to take care of you as well. When they were coming to my house, <coughs> I told the door is locked. Yep. There's a key in this little spot. Mm -hmm. you find yep. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You can tell the dispatcher, and we have computers in all of our ambulances. And so what the dispatcher can do is say, Fitrona, look at your computer, there's a message on there. Because he's not going to get on over the radio and say, hey, Fitrona, this address here, they have a key stuck under, right under the map. You know, so anyone who's listening can figure that out. So what they'll do is they'll send us a message on the computer, and I can scroll down and I can look and say, oh, there's a key right here. And we can get access that way. So then we don't have to break your door. They very nice. told me we'll put it right back. Yes, yes. There, there are some people who like us to put keys to their homes or their apartments in our ambulance, and I really frown on that because I really don't want that responsibility. I just, you know, I just, I don't want to mess with it. Too much responsibility. We have enough on our shoulders already. It does. It fits real true. And, and just a couple of, more, you know, yep. to dovetail from what Cindy was saying, there are a couple of legal issues that go with this. One is police don't break down the door. Mm -hmm. okay. Firefighters can, police can't, because what we never want to get into is a situation where police break in, maybe they find something that's not supposed to be there, and now you've got a situation of, well, unlawful search and seizure and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So even if the police are on the scene and say, can you get us in here, the firefighters, nope, we can't. So the firefighters go in, we're not going to be looking to see if you have your marijuana out Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the other issue is that, as Cindy kind of talked about, once you call 911, we're going in. Yeah. It doesn't matter, you know, if, if, if you know, we're going to check it out. Because we've seen too many scenarios over the years. What if you call and then you fall unconscious? Do we say, oh, well, they must not need us anymore? No, of course not. What if you are in a, an abusive situation where somebody is keeping you from completing your phone call? So once that 911 call goes in, 
we're going to go, we're going to respond, and we're going to go in until we can make sure that you're safe in your home. I can further add to that. Yeah. You have to talk to them very, very thoroughly if they're going to let you stay home. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fact. That is a fact. And we're going to talk about that in just a couple of minutes. If we can jump over these questions for just a minute and finish out the, the rest of it, um, then we'll go back to questions. Um, when should you dial 911? As Tom said, we know some people are a little skittish about calling 911. They're either embarrassed or they don't want to cause trouble or they, they are still deciding if it's really worth a call. You know, how bad off am I? Now, I have this experience in my own family where my parents were the kind that, eh, I don't know if we should call. So what happens? My dad lays on the floor with a broken hip for two hours. My mom says, should I call? Should I call? Should I call? Eh, I don't know. Let me see. I'll wait a little bit longer. You know, for a lot of those things, you're only making it worse. The thing of it is, because of the protocols that 911 has in place, they're going to talk you in it. They'll let you know if you need an ambulance. You know, and, and beyond that, Cindy's team, our, our paramedics, we're there. We're there on a 24-hour shift. So when you call, we're happy to go and check it out. And if it turns out, oh, no, it's not that big a deal, we don't need to transport you, okay, no harm, no foul. But what if it is something? And that brings me to my second story. This is my mom. Uh, a couple of years, uh, no, it's been five years now. Uh, she uh, was on the phone with my brother. My family all lives in St. Louis. And so she's on the phone with my brother, and something didn't sound right to him. Couldn't quite pinpoint it, but he didn't feel that everything was okay. Now, a lot of us would have said, I better go over there and check it out. Here's what my brother did, and I will always be grateful to him. He got on a different phone, called 911, got the paramedics started, and then met him over at my parents' house. And in fact, my mom was having a stroke. And because of his quick response and the paramedic's quick response, they were able to limit the damage. And she made a, a recovery, and we had her with us for another four years before we lost her. And so, you know, that was huge. And if you think about it in those terms, you think you're buying time. You're buying time for maybe living a few more years with good quality of life. You're also buying time in terms of recovery because when you have um, stroke, heart attack, um, for that matter, falls, you know, recovery time can really expand based on how quickly you get the appropriate care. So don't hesitate to call. If you think you need a police officer or a sheriff's deputy, just call 911. Mm -hmm. If you think you need an ambulance for any reason, call 911. Fire department, of course, call 911. They'll help you. They'll help you work through it and decide what the appropriate response is for your needs. As Cindy mentioned, know where you are. You got to stay calm. I think these are actually Tom's now that I think about it. Am I right? Yeah, you're doing fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jump in if you need to. Yeah. Take a deep breath. And as Tom said, you know, it's like you're, 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 you're in an emergency situation. Uh, you don't deal with those every day, so you're going to be flustered. You're going to be a little panicked. Take a deep breath. Try to calm yourself down. And your question was perfect. Allow the folks on the other end to manage the conversation. They'll take you through the questions. Remember, and I think this is a really important point. Tom mentioned it. But remember, when you're on the phone talking to the call taker, they can still be dispatching your response. So just because they're asking questions and you're going, don't ask me any more questions, just get here. Remember that he can be dispatching, but still listening and interacting with you on the phone, okay? Because there are other people there backing him up. Uh, so answer the questions as they come. Don't argue, just take it. They're, they're in that sequence for a reason. And, and then follow those directions. Uh, just as Cindy has a medical director for the Fitrona EMS service, there is a Dane County medical director um, who is there as a resource for us, and of course, they are accredited, and they don't give those out lightly, so you're in good hands. Um, prepare for emergencies. 
you know, one of the best things you can do is keep good information nearby at all times. Um, for our paramedics, I know, and I, I bet for Cindy's too, one of the most useful things you can do is get a list of your medications and any chronic conditions you may have. And you don't need anything fancy. Put it on a piece of paper, write emergency at the top of it, and get a magnet and put it on your refrigerator. Paramedics will look like for that. It will help them. They'll know now if you have allergies, if you have a chronic condition. They're not going to make their diagnosis off that sheet of paper, but they're going to be more attuned to things that might be part of that condition. They're going to look at the, the, uh, the prescription drugs you may be on or even over the counter that might interact with any other treatment. So that's important information for them to have. Um, the light on is, is a great help, yes. but you know the best help is having a nice, easily seen address on your house. That is, is huge. Um, one of the things that we see sometimes is what we call a vanity address. You know, I, I know for, for myself coming over here today, I'm like, where is this place? You know, I thought it was for, closer to the, the highway there, and so I'm driving along. So for you to say, I'm at the Verona Senior Center, may or may not be helpful. But if you say I'm at 108 Paoli, now we've got more to work with. By the same token, if you're in a larger facility, um, apartment complex, whatever it may be, if you can tell them, you know, I am on the second floor, uh, don't, don't just give a room number because buildings are numbered differently. Don't say I'm at stairwell A. Think in terms of the north side of the building, the part of the building that faces out onto Paoli. You know, this, this can help to orient responders so they know better where to go. And of course, as Cindy mentioned earlier, if you have the option of sending somebody to meet the responders, you're way ahead of the game. Uh, this is something that has become a real issue keep communication information with you, keep identification with you. Um, we recommend that in addition to what you put on your refrigerator at home, that you carry a little cheat sheet, cheat sheet with you in your, your wallet or your purse. Um, it's just a real helpful thing uh, if you're out and about and you're not able to communicate with uh, the paramedics. That will give them some backstory on you. Um, ID bracelets, if you have a chronic condition, Talk to your physician about getting one of those. And know this, if that link on that bracelet has been broken, you can't just tape it back together, okay? It has to be all of a piece for paramedics to respond to that information. Um, sadly, there are just too many incidences of people messing around. So whether it's a DNR bracelet, uh, uh, you know, heart condition, uh, I have a pacemaker, any of those things, make sure that you're wearing it and it's intact. That's all something you discuss with your physician. Um, and then your own information. So we can, we can know who we're dealing with. Secondarily, some contact information. Your next of kin, the person you want contacted if something happens to you. Um, it can be on a paste, piece of paper with more people carrying uh, cell phones. Next slide. We're seeing a lot of people use uh, what we call ICE, which stands for in case of emergency. And what you do is you program ICE into your cell phone, and then with that heading, you're going to have the, you know, the numbers of the people you want contacted if something happens to you. So that's a real quick and easy way for the responders to look in your cell phone and go, oh, okay, you know, ICE, this is who they want me to contact. It may be the responders, it may not, because they're working fast, but they'll certainly use it at the hospital. Okay, next. Uh, we talked about this, medical information, really, really helpful for you as well as our responders. Here are some of the things we really want to key in on. If you got chest pains, call 911. Don't wait around and say, oh, I'm sure it'll pass. Signs of stroke, facial droop, um, change, slurred speech, things of that nature. Um, don't wait. You know, you're, you've got a brain bleed going. 
for every moment that you delay, you are losing something neurologically, and your recovery is going to be lengthy, and you may never recover fully. Uh, heavy bleeding uh, seems pretty obvious. Sudden loss of consciousness, um, those are the kinds of things that you just go, no brainer, call 911. Okay, I think that pretty much covers what we wanted to cover, and that gives us some room for questions, so have at it. With the use of the cell phones, then, Tom, maybe this goes back to what you were saying. If I'm traveling out of the 608 area code mm -hmm. and, it, and I'm on the road and I need an emergency, does it pick up the local cell phone tower and then go to that dispatch center, or does it yes. kick back to Okay. It, it knows what tower it's, it's, it's connecting to, and in some cases, and it's getting better and better, it not only knows what tower you're hitting, but if you triangulate oh, okay. use it, or, or your phone has got a built-in GPS, it actually knows right where you are standing or driving and it'll plot you on a map there. So that's how cellular technology works where you've got a phone from California and you're in Madison. You call 911, you get Madison's 911. Okay, thank you. But, but in an addendum to that, one of the things that's really important to note is if you, for instance, let's take my scenario of my brother on the phone with my mother. What if he had been in another state and he, you know, he knows something's wrong with my mom, there's no way he can get there. What happens, Tom? Uh, in those cases, and we get those calls as well, you're in Madison and you've talked to your mother in St. Louis that may be having problems. You dial 911, we're going to take that call, we're going to get the information, get the address from you to where the emergency is. We will take that and find the 911 center that's responsible for that address in Missouri or Nome, Alaska if we need to and get the responders going. So we will take calls for the entire United States or beyond. So that's another way to sort of shorten that timeline. You, you can call 911. No. You can call 911 in Madison or and, and, and even if it's for somebody wherever, they're going to process that call and give the help that is needed to the place, even if it's in another state, right. even if it's in another country. country actually, yeah. and with the IP, IP phones, that's happening. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, I have this medical loop bracelet, but it doesn't look like it's anything. It looks like one of those dollar loop strong things that work. Do you really check for that? Are you going to notice that, or am I fooling myself? That we look. That? Okay. I, I'm allergic to every metal note made to man, so yeah. I, you know I have to add this plastic yeah. thing. And but is it really doing me any good? Well, we we look for that. If you're unresponsive, we're going to do a full assessment. We're looking all over trying to figure out stuff. So we'll look for bracelets. We'll look for necklaces. Sometimes people put them on their ankles, and we do look for that. But again, we're we're very busy <coughs> to start with, so we're not doing that right away. We're when we initially start taking care of you, we're just trying to get you stabilized as much as we can, and then we start looking into, are there any bracelets, any identification that we can find, and, and then we're trying to figure out what's going on, but we absolutely will look. It looks a little odd to me, but. <laughs> She'll look at it. Yes, yeah. I will look at it, yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't think you can overstate the high level of care that you get from paramedics, and, and that brings one other point to mind. Um, we talked early on about agencies working together. One of the things that the agencies across Dane County have done is created a consortium of all um, paramedic or what we sometimes call advanced life support services. And so that includes Fitchrona, Middleton, I think Town of Madison, Sun Prairie. And what that means is that you're going to get the, if you have a serious medical emergency, of any kind, you're going to get the ambulance that's closest to you, whether it comes from Fitchrona into Madison, whether it comes to Madison into Verona or Fitchburg. Um, tell the story about Sun Prairie on oh, the way out. Oh, certainly, yeah. We received a call from East High School on East Washington Avenue, and um, someone was having a serious medical issue. And one would think that in Madison at East High School, you would send a Madison paramedic. But with this technology that we have, the dispatcher was able to look at the map, and we see where ambulances are on our map. We see them driving around on the map. They look at the map and they see Sun Prairie Ambulance was going down East Washington Avenue on their way back to Sun Prairie after dropping off a patient. 
They were right in front of where this person needed an ambulance. We called them on the radio and they were there. They were a block away, basically. Um, and, and that happens on a fairly regular basis where we're sending the closest ambulance um, when it's needed. As we mentioned when we started, ambulances are by far the busiest apparatus we have. In Madison, we have about 25,000 emergency calls each year. About 80% of those are for medical emergencies. And that number's going up. Fire calls are going down. And I'm happy to say fire calls are going down in large part because we have been teaching prevention because we put smoke alarms and sprinklers in buildings. All of those things have served to reduce the number of serious fire calls that we get. We still get plenty, don't get me wrong, but you know, it's really made a difference. Uh, so, so we, our, our paramedics are wildly busy all the time. I know Cindy's group is busy. So, you know, that's why we need to kind of pull our resources together so that we can respond regardless of jurisdictional boundaries. Now, that brings me to the other point, and I saw some heads nodding uh, when we talked about fire trucks responding to um, emergency medical calls. I'm not sure how often you see that here. We do, yeah. yeah, quite often, but it's based on our dispatch. Right. Certainly it happens in Madison quite a bit. Now, all of our firefighters are emergency medical technicians. Is that the case with Fitchburg? Uh, with Fitchburg, they're full-timers are all yeah. EMT, yeah. So that's that's kind of been, become a condition of employment, that if you're a Madison or Fitchburg firefighter, you also have your EMT. Now, that equates to what we sometimes call basic life support as opposed to the advanced life support of paramedics. But what that means is that a lot of times, if it's not a serious uh, emergent threat, you know, somebody, you know, it, you talked about the priority dispatch. Right. Let's say it's an Alpha or a Bravo, Bravo call. You know, so suddenly, you know, let's, if we don't have an ambulance ready right away, we can still send a crew out there to start to assist, assess, and care for patients. And then if transport is needed, an ambulance will come along. The, the thing that I think is important to note, you know, most of us will remember the days of the ambulance that was basically a, a tricked out uh, station wagon. And, and back in the day it was scoop and go, you know. Let's get somebody scooped up, shove them in there, and get them to the hospital as quick as we can. Now we talk about pre-hospital care. Even though we still want to get you to the hospital as quickly as possible. There's a lot paramedics can do to treat you, to stabilize you um, before you leave the scene and on the way to the hospital. So the care is at a much higher level than it's ever been before. I can tell you another thing. Okay. <clears throat> I have a younger brother whose health has not been the best. And I was talking to him, and he suddenly wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh my God. They tried to call back again and I got a busy thing that meant the phone was off the hook. Yeah. So I called my mom, gave him his rest, told him I didn't know what was happening there, but he just hung up on me. So a little while later, either I called him again or he called me. But anyhow, I got police wrapping on my book. So did you call 911? I said, oh, I sure did. I hope that ever worked out all right. And he said, oh, yes, it did. Mm -hmm. But we're just checking up because we want to be sure that the 911 phone calls from the Roma were coming through as we want them to. Uh -huh. And so we're just following through. Mm -hmm. the, 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 this is where the call had come from. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to check up on that. Now my brother has this thing. It can't be things you're in trouble. If you're having any health problems, oh, don't hang up on her. <laughs> 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 you know, I, it's it's amazing over the years the, the different things I've learned about what 911 does. It. And and you know, Cindy, I think can attest to this too. There are so many redundancies built into the system, and there is a continuous improvement process. But the one I remember um, was when we were doing some work on uh, emergency preparedness. And one of the topics we were talking about was carbon monoxide poisoning. And uh, 
our medical director at the time pulled up a, a tape from 911 that goes back a few years. But on it, um, talk about instructive. There's a woman and she's calling 911. She says, you know, my husband's sick. You know, so I think I need an ambulance. Well, in, the, in just the space of a minute or so, you can hear that she starts to get confused. And she's starting to become ill and not really making sense anymore. And the 911 call taker, you know, reasoned that it could possibly be carbon monoxide, advised, you know, open the windows, get air in, and dispatch somebody all at the same time. And because of that, those two people survived. But I mean, it happens so, so very quickly. And so, you know, they've got their protocol cards, but they're also trained to, you know, kind of reason out things. I'm hearing something, this could be this, could be that. So they do a little bit of diagnostics on the fly, and that's why it really is accurate to call them the first first responders. Yeah, you guys save a lot of lives, I'm sure, too, every year. Thank you year, for what just, you do. Yeah. You're very courageous. You know, Two weeks ago, <laughs> Yesterday, we had a, a medical emergency down here, and yeah. within five minutes, uh, we had one police officer, three um, Petrona, and four firefighters within five minutes. So if you're going to get sick, here's a good place to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah, yes, go ahead. I, say, I have two experiences with 911. Um, my husband got a new phone cell phone, and there was a help button on it. Well, I thought the help button meant help with the phone. It was 911. <laughs> it doesn't say 911 on the phone. It says help. And so I called. It's been even months. And I thought they answered too, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, sure. And the police yeah. came. I was just going to yeah. say, and I'm sure the police came yeah. to your home too, oh, yeah. because they don't take it lightly. Yeah, and they made me get off the sofa and go upstairs and so make sure I was okay too. And then um, in November, I had a car accident on Fish Entry Road. And this brings the point up. I could, I, I could see absolutely no building numbers. I could not tell them what block I was in. I had no idea. I said, well, I'm in front of this apartment complex and I'm across the street from this gas station, but I had no idea what block I was in or anything. And um, then I thought I was on hold with my cell phone and I couldn't hear anything. You know, they just said stay on the line. And then all of a sudden my phone rang that they were calling me back. But then I ran out of juice, so <laughs> but by that time I had the fire trucks were already there, but the ambulances weren't yet, and, but then the, then the police finally came and things. We spend a lot of time, in fact, right now we just started uh, uh, an academy class uh, of seven new dispatchers, and one of my, I really enjoy doing it, is, is teaching the classroom portion of our dispatch training, and, and we're in a classroom for eight weeks, and a lot of that, frankly, is on geography, knowing the county. Um, the advantage of having 15 people in the room at one time, there generally is going to be somebody that knows where the old where Miller's Curve is, yes. <laughs> who knows where the pink elephant is, um, and knows that you, where you can actually close your eyes and picture where they are without mm -hmm. them knowing where they are. Because a lot of times people aren't, they don't know where they are. Mm -hmm. um, I think back of, you know, I'm on the interstate. Well, we're on the interstate. I don't know. Well, tell me what you see. I see Kaiser Ford on one side and American TV on the other side. Okay, you're on the Beltline, you're not on the interstate. You know, just mm -hmm. knowing and having lived in the community, you know where these places are, and, and you can just through questioning, cell phone technology is, is great because it, it sometimes gets you at least in the right part of the county. But where it becomes challenging is when people are on snow, snowmobile trails or out on the lake. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> every, you know, if you're on Lake Monona, you're on Monona, you're just out from the, the Monona Terrace, regardless of where you are in that lake, because you can see the Monona Terrace from anywhere on the lake. So yeah. um, those become a little more challenging, but we spend a lot of time on geography and uh, really value those those people that join our department that grew up in the community. So. I'll follow up on that. Um, because my car has the OnStar and everything, mm -hmm. would it have been better that I push the emergency button on the on the vehicle than use my cell phone? You can do that as well. Um, one one thing with OnStar that, that's really exciting is OnStar is now nationally accredited uh, with the emergency medical oh. protocols, the same as we are. 
So what happens now when OnStar uh, calls us with that location, they not only know where you are because OnStar's GPS systems are pretty pretty right on, yeah, they but are. they're actually just giving us the code now. They've already asked you all the questions and they can be the first first responder. Um, I think OnStar's the only other company that does that now and I think uh, Dr. Stiegler is their medical director as well. So. I've been in a crash with OnStar and I gotta say, it's pretty slight. it was amazing. We were on an interstate um, down in Springfield, Illinois and the drunk came across the interstate right in front of us. And you know, there you sit and all of a sudden, you know, airbags deployed and you're kind of, what just happened? And there's somebody, this voice going, are you all right? It looks like you've been in a crash. <laughs> yeah, we have. <laughs> and, and boy, the response was just bang. All of a sudden, there are people cutting us out. And all. I mean, it was amazing. And it was very, very comforting to have somebody who knew where you were, knew something had happened, and was going to get help to you. It made a big difference. <laughs> The original number scene really makes it on the scene. Keeps the image very clean and I need it. Try to watch the star.